I want to invite you to open your Bibles if you want to follow along. We'll have it on the screen as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at three chapters worth of material, but I'm not preaching exhaustively on every verse and every chapter, so you can relax a little bit about that. Uh, but I am going to uh, cover a lot of material today, and actually we will end up reading chapter 59 as a whole uh, when we get to it. But uh, we're, we're going through uh, Isaiah together, and uh, Pastor Derek has been doing a great job bringing us together and, and, and uh, ended a, uh, the se what's known as the second section of uh, Isaiah. Some have decided to, to uh, divide Isaiah into three books. I don't think it's three separate books. I think it's one book. I'm not a divisionist. That's what they would be calling a person. And uh, I'm a believer that Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah. <laughs> And that what gives a lot of people in their theological study difficulty is that Isaiah was able, by the will of God, to prophesy by name specific people that would be used of God to do what God was going to do. And so some theologians in their, quote, higher criticism study determined that that's just not possible. It must be a second writer. Or it must be a third writer when you get to 66 through 66. I, I just don't believe that. I, I, don't, I think there's ample evidence to see God prophesying through the individuals in miraculous ways. And, and so I think we have a message from a prophet that was laid on the heart of God, that, that was laid on his heart by God, the message that we need. And revealed to us some things that are just phenomenal about his heart toward us. And I think that's what we're going to see some of together this morning as we go through Isaiah 56 through 59. We're going to get a, a, another awareness, another friend look of what God's desire for you and I is. You know, what he was after in his original plan, because you know, God loved us and, and had a plan from the foundation of the world. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think it was like God started out with Adam and Eve and it didn't go so well, so he decided to. That's not the way it went. According to scripture, God had a plan from the foundation of the world and was aware very clearly how things would go. And in the unfolding of that, at the proper time, at the, that's what the scripture tells us, right? At the proper time, Christ came. As the fulfillment of God's plan, that we might walk in relationship with the Holy God. So Isaiah gives a lot of information about that whole story. But we've covered a, a tremendous amount of it. So in these, in these particular three chapters, we're going to see a little bit of it again about what God's hope was in the way that relationship would be. Because that's what God was really after from the beginning, is relationship. And you can see that all the way back to the picture of God walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. Just enjoying fellowship with them, letting them know who he was. As he made Adam and Eve in, don't forget this, our image. Because the plan was always there. And God was always having a plan to reveal himself to humanity later. I'm going to start off in Isaiah 56, 4-5. We're going to look at those verses. And I want to get your mind, if we can, together, get our minds wrapped around this idea. That one of the greatest things about God in calling us into relationship with Him, and we can think about that as in this season even, is the idea of God wanting us to have a better name. You know, we think about gift-giving a lot this in the Christmas season, right? One of the things that God has given us is the gift of a better name. Let me, let me try to pull that together in mind for a moment of these verses. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me, and behold, and, excuse me, and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Wow. That's, that's really powerful when you think about it. As you unpack chapter 56 of Isaiah, you see that there were foreigners and eunuchs being folded into the family of God. And just like you and I have been folded into. We'll come back to that in a moment. But the reason I'm focusing in on this verse to start out is, is this idea of what was happening with the eunuchs. And think about... The condition of a eunuch in that time. A eunuch was a person who had, was no longer able to be uh, have children. 
We're going to leave it for that. The adults get it. You want more explanation than that? Kids, ask your mom and dad later. Okay? <laughs> and so they are serving in the household of God as one that knows they have no opportunity for the furthering of their family. Now, for some guys today, this is still a super big deal, but not nearly as much as it used to be back in the day about the worst thing that could happen to a guy was to not see his name be carried on. I mean, that was like the worst. I mean, it, it's so much so that, sad to say, ladies, there was a day that some dads, they, they were really upset when they had a daughter instead of a son. That's, that's really sad. But that's the way some people were bent out of shape. And so eunuchs in this condition, that was a done deal. That's over. That's never going to happen now. And so in their mind was this idea that, wow, well, I, don't, I don't have a name. I don't have a legacy. And in some sense, they would even say, my identity's as good as dead. And in the context of that situation, we see this verse presented to remind them, as they're folded into the family of God, hey, don't worry about your legacy. I got a better name for you. I got a better name for you. So I want to get wrapped around this morning the idea that's coming through Isaiah here that God has called us into relationship with him <coughs> and in doing so has given us a better name, has given us a new identity. And we're going to see how we're folding into all that here in a little while. But that's really what he's uh, messaging to the people here in these next three chapters. And it was a, a prophecy for the entire people of God. So even as we saw in the last few uh, sermons, especially last week, Pastor Derek helping us see that, that God had called us to come to him, to be, to be responsive to his call to him. And so now we're called into this relationship. He's calling us to a genuine relationship. What do I mean by that? Because you know how you can, you can be in a relationship and not have your heart in it. A genuine relationship is a relationship where somebody has vested themselves and their heart into that relationship. So often is the case, even within Christian community, there are people that have a relationship, we say, in name only. But God wants us to have an understanding of what it means to be brought into his relationship and us giving a, getting a name that is his name upon. And so now we have a new identity and a total genuine relationship with our holy God. So as we look at those opening verses, we see the importance of that through, through the concept that the eunuchs would have understood. I want us to look at, at a few things, and we'll just reference some of the places in, in chapter 57, 56, 57, 58, just relating to this idea of God's love and his call for us. We just want to be reminded that God loves all. Now, we can go through a lot of, you know, theological discourse about our belief system and our theological understandings of whether or not we think God calls everybody or not. I'm, I'm one of those that believe God does call everybody. I'm a whosoever will guy. Now, I, I understand the person that has a, a five-point Calvinist mentality will say, well, hey, that, there's more to it than that. There is, there is. I get all that, okay? A lot of study and all that. But I really believe the heart of God, as a father who loves all, has a heart that says, you can come if you're willing. Hey, by the way, there's contingencies on that. It's got to be my way. That's the contingency. So you can come, but you can't come on your terms. You come on his terms. And so as we understand that, we realize that we see a God presented in Scripture from the beginning of time, really. And, and I can't go through the whole Bible in one sermon to touch on all the many places that you just see that God is clearly called whosoever will. But it's there. And God pours out his love toward us and that he wants all who will repent. That's one of those contingencies. All who will repent of sin and be in, and here we go, in covenant relationship. What does that mean? It means that when I'm in a relationship, in a covenant relationship, I'm fully vested. We could go through a lot of detail about all the importance of covenant relationship and, and the splitting of the animal between and the walking between the two blood examples of the animal split. And it was like saying, I am all in on this relationship. To the very last drop of blood in my body, I am all in. 
in this relationship. You need to understand when you come to Christ in a relationship with God, or come to God in a relationship through Christ, that it's not supposed to be this kind of, oh, I walk the aisle and I sign the dotted line mentality. It's supposed to be, God, I come and I give all that I am and receive all that you are. And so in that relationship, there's the concept of giving all that I am means I don't have anything back here anymore. I'm repenting from that, the way of life without God's presence in me. And now I'm walking in total, this is, this is big, total surrender to him. See, that, that concept has to be there in relationship with God. It, it means, God, what you want now is what I want. I'm not dealing with the issue right now in this moment as to whether or not we have struggles in that commitment. We're going to come to that in just a second. I'm just talking about what God asks for when you come. What God asks for when you come is repentance from sin. Sorry for that, God. A repentance includes a turning away from it. God, I just want to go your way now. Maybe you're going to slip up and make mistakes. We'll come to that. But it's clear that's what I want. I'm not coming so I might be able to get a, a little, you know, cabin on the hillside in heaven that we're thinking about. I'm coming because my life's a mess. It's full of sin. I need forgiveness. I've got no hope anywhere else but in you. You invite me to come and receive what you've done to take care of that, which we'll touch on. And so I'm coming repentant, turning, all in. I'm coming in covenant relationship. The old, you know, we talk about it. We've got plenty of verses. The old is what? Passed away. The new has come. That's the invitation. That's the invitation God was given to Israel from the beginning. He never called Israel into a half-committed, half-hearted committed relationship. He wanted them to know it was an all-in commitment relationship. As this is crucial because the message of salvation is not clear without understanding that God was calling Israel to an all-in, fully devoted relationship. And we know what happens in that, happened in that, what happened in that relationship as a result. Did they, did, they, did they measure up to every call God made for them? No. They didn't. Was the relationship over? I mean, there's a problem. Something's got to be dealt with. It's not what God called for. God called for all in. Repent. Covenant relationship. And so if that's not happening, there's a problem, right? And that was part of God's whole plan to show the need for his provision so that he could cover that issue. So you can't leave that out of the mix. You can't have in the mix the idea that God calls people to himself, but hey, a little dab will do you. No, this is not a real cream relationship, some of you old people know. <laughs> this is a all in. i got to fill that in blank for the young people. That used to be a hair stuff to fill in here. Okay? And they used to have a commercial that says, real cream, a little dab will do you. And then take care of your hair. It took care of mine. I used to <laughs> That's enough. So, <laughs> so God's calling for an all-in. Listen, he wants a full moose relationship. All right? He wants it all there, all committed. And so he realizes, though, and he, by the way, God wasn't surprised. Do you think God got shocked when he called the people to a covenant relationship and said, repent, turn toward me. That's what he said very clearly here about repenting. And when they repent, turn toward him. Was he shocked when they messed up? He wasn't shocked. He knew what was going to happen. He had a plan for that. So God calls us all, I believe, into a you know, a covenant relationship. All may come. The initial call is to the Israelites, initiate, initiating through Abraham, setting up a plan for us to all understand. In this passage, in, in uh, Isaiah 56, 1 through 8, we can see that it wasn't just to the Israelites even in this day. Let's just read through these real quick. And I'm not going to to uh, break down every thought in these eight verses. But as we look at them, I think I had them in there. Did my verses not come through? I did it. I did it. So we're going to be here another place uh, in 57. And then we're going to be in 59. Just so you know what's up, Steve. Thus says the Lord. 
preserve justice and do righteousness for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness is to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from pervading my, my Sabbath. And so he points out a few of the things that, that he's interested in happening in their life when they come full hearted and keeps his hand from doing evil. Let not the foreigner, this is interesting, who has joined himself to the Lord say the Lord will surely separate me from his people. No. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. In other words, I have no legacy. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and to those who, uh, who, who choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial. And a name better than that of sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from pervading the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. It's interesting. In another place, God says, you know, you're wearing me out with your fake sacrifices. But this is not the case here because he's dealing with a person who's come with a genuine heart commitment. And so he says, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, ah, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. So even more I'm gathering together, not just the dispersed of the house of Israel. I'm gathering those who will come in response, a, a, a repentant response, that they need him and that they will come to him. And they'll come with an attitude of walking in genuine relationship. And he'll embrace them and bring them in. And that's exactly what he's done throughout the years. And he's called us there. You and I are here today because of responding to that call. You and I have come to the place in our life, those of us that are believers in Christ Jesus, that we're aware we needed help, we needed an answer for the sin of our life, and we had nowhere else to turn, and we turned to God, and we said, okay, God, you said I can come, I'm a whosoever will, would you forgive me? And he did. And he changed our life. And I know what happened to me, I assume it happened to you the same way. And you began to realize how much he loved you, and his presence was placed inside of you, and you began to be aware of the fact that you were different than you were before. And all of our stories are just a little bit different, but that one thing's in common for real kids. Well, as we go through this passage and we think about what's going on here in Isaiah, there's another aspect of this relationship that we got to get a hold of. No doubt that God called us, and God called us with intent. Did you see? We're not going to go into all the studies of the Sabbath and all that kind of stuff right now. But did you notice that God's starting to point out some things you ought to be doing and you ought not be doing in this relationship? And then he's honoring those who choose to do what they ought to do, and he's telling those that are not doing what they ought not do, you need to get that mess cleaned up. <laughs> he's called them into this relationship. And they're, you know, I've heard people say something that I'm about to say now that I disagree with. I've heard people say that when you come to Christ, when you come to a relationship with God, he has no expectations. That's not true. They got that out of the Bible because it ain't in the Bible. They got it out there somewhere. <laughs> That's a pun, okay. It's not in the Bible. They didn't get it from the Bible. God has some expectations. God knows your frailty and knows your inabilities, and he's going to deal with that. We're going to talk about that in a second. But please don't think in your relationship with God that is a covenant relationship it's a relationship that God says anything goes, it doesn't really matter. I have no real expectations of you. God calls us in our relationship to him just as we are. But I want you to know, he doesn't want us to remain just as we are. He calls us into a whole new life of submission to him and a desire to walk in the path that he's called us to walk in. And he knows our shortcomings, and he knows our problems, and that's why he made a provision to deal with all that. And so that's essentially what you see also in the book of Isaiah. As we look at chapter 56, verse 9, through, and all the way to the end of chapter 57, I'm not going to read all that, but that's essentially what it's dealing with. God's 
beginning to point out to them the fact, guess what? All these things that I would really like to see in your life, you're not going to be able to do them. I mean, you guys are already messing up by the numbers. Modern day interpretation. <laughs> and I realize that, but I, you know, I've got a plan for you. And he does have a plan for us. When in relationship with God, you know, when we're called to that relationship, we need to understand that God's called us to a, to a life of submission to his will. And if we have this attitude, let me, let me picture it this way. It's like a marriage. It's like a marriage. That sounds a little weird to say I'm married to God, but we know the motifs in the New Testament, right? God uses us as the bride and Jesus as the groom. And, and in a marriage, there's a commitment one to another that you're going to be committed to each other. So when a person breaks that relationship in marriage, they end up in adultery. They really harm that relationship, haven't they? Messed it up. And do you realize that in a sense, when we choose to sin, in the relationship that we have with God, it's kind of like committing spiritual adultery. It's like saying to God, yeah, I know that I made this deal that I'm going to come and come in a relationship with you, and, and I gave you my heart, and I know you came to live inside of me, but I'm going to go out and do what I want to do, whenever I want to do it. Because I know I'll come home and you'll say, oh, don't do that again, it'll be all right. To, to think that way about the relationship with God is to live an adulterous life with God. And there's a lot of scriptural analogies that we could pull into that. In the context that we're looking at in 56 and 57, some in 58, God begins to use the whole idea of the Sabbath and the way people are really dishonoring the Sabbath, the, the fasting that they're supposed to be doing to honor God in their life and misusing that as well. And he begins to point all that out. Go read those and you'll see how that is. And God's revealing to them that you, you know better than that. That's essentially what he's saying. Come on, guys. You know that's not what I'm about. And so he points it all out through the illustration of the Sabbath in chapter, um, uh, or different ways. In chapter 57, 1 through, uh, 11 through 13, let's look at those for a second. Steve, you can pull those up. We get some, some understanding about that. Actually, through those chapters, we get several places of sin that God's pointing out. The profaning of the Sabbath, the misuse of the fasting, greed dissatisfaction in their walk with God, lack of respect for God. Uh, in uh, chapter 58, verse 3 through 5, a lot of that's addressed as well. In chapter 57, even the leaders, oh, come on, not really, yeah, even the leaders that were supposed to be walking in submission to relationship, setting a pattern for the people to see to know how to walk with, they were profaning their relationship with God as well. Look at 57, 11 through 13. Of whom you were worried and fearful when you lied, and did not remember me, nor give me a thought. Was I not silent, even for a long time? So you did not fear. What's that about? Haven't I just shown a lot of patience, and still walking in obstinance with me? I will declare your righteousness and your deeds, but they will not profit you. In other words, you're not walking in righteousness. <laughs> When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. It's on now. You know? Lest you wonder how God really feels about that stuff. Just read that again. What God's saying is, hey, what happened to us being in covenant relationship? Hey, if you want to go ahead and commit spiritual adultery, just go on out with that. Let that deliver you. And so he goes on and says, But the wind will carry all of them up, and a breath will take them away. But he, oh, here it is. He who takes refuge in me will inherit the land and will, will possess my holy mountain. And so God shows again his heart toward us in this covenant relationship. He knows what he's calling us to. He's showing you and me what he's willing to be and what he's willing to do. And then in the context of all that, we're aware of all this struggle with flesh and humanity, right? Let me ask you this. Has anybody here ever really, I mean, you're a person who gave your heart to the Lord, come in a relationship, but in that relationship, you've messed up once or twice. Wow, the rest of y'all are pretty saints. Pretty good saints. I messed up once or twice. And in the context of that, I, I realized that 
I fell short somehow. And it, and it wounds me because I know my heart. Those of you that are in covenant relationship with the Lord, when you breach that covenant, equal to sinning, when you breach that covenant, there's a wound in your heart because you know what you committed to. And it brings sorrow to you. And so you end up finding yourselves going back to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. Because you want to repair that relationship. Hopefully that's where your heart is. If you're in covenant relationship, that's where your heart is. I will say this. This is a strong statement. If that's not your heart, guess what? Romans 8 says you're not his. He that has not the Spirit of God calling out from him to that kind of relationship is none of his, that scripture says. So if you're, if you're fooled by thinking because you're a member or because you attend church or because you go through Christian motions or whatever, and you're thinking, oh, man, I'm good, but I can live any way I want. I can call my own shots. I can do it the way I want to. And then inside of you, there's not something saying, no, you can't. You're mine. We're in relationship. We do it this way. If that's not happening... You should be having like a little check flag go up. Lord, am I really yours? Am I able to so easily dismiss what you want in my life? And if you can, you should be concerned. But if you know down deep that's what you're committed to, you may have some struggles in getting there, but you know you're going to get there. You're going to be in submission to him, and he's going to walk in relationship with you. So Isaiah is really addressing that even with God's people from the get-go. And so they begin to realize, man, I do have struggles. But I am committed to a relationship of faithfulness with God. But as you go through those chapters, you begin to see God saying, yeah, but what about this unfaithfulness? It's a matter of faithfulness, not of list keeping. Can you think about that in your relationship for a moment? Is your relationship with God based on faithfulness? Or is it based on list keeping? Because if we go through the list keeping, Isaiah kind of points out some of the list keeping, you are going to come up short. But when it comes to faithfulness, is your heart ever able to be drawn back to relationship and faithfulness to Him? Your relationship with God should be on faithfulness, not on list keeping. It's not a matter of list keeping. It's a matter of faithfulness. Oh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be interested in keeping what honors God. Right? Because you are faithful. And that's what you want to be. It's a matter of identity in the family and having the family name when it comes to this covenant relationship. Not a matter of what's permitted. I want you to think these things through with me for a second. So many people come to a relationship with God. God's called them to this repentant relationship. God's made clear what he would like to see happening in there. He's aware of your shortcomings. We're still coming to that. But he has made clear what he would like to see happening in your life. And for so many, for them, the relationship's kind of like this. Okay, I know God has some desires for me. But he's not real clear on this. And this is not so bad, so I think I can kind of do that. And you just fill in the blanks. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So in that relationship with the Holy Spirit, he's the one that's supposed to be able to call the shots. He's the one that ought to be setting that final direction. So what's it really a matter of? It's a matter of him and his identity becoming my identity. And so I make decisions because of what might please my Heavenly Father, not what I might be permitted to do. You follow me? Paul knows the verse I'm thinking about right now. All, it might be lawful, but it might not be the best thing. And if you're living based on what's lawful, you are getting shortchanged in what it means to have the family name on your life. The family name... The name of God through Christ Jesus on our life is a whole different way of life than what I can get away with and what's okay and what I'm permitted to do. It's a mindset that says, God, this is your family. How do you want me to live? And now I'm willing to surrender to that. 
Even though it might be a difficult at time. And I'm trusting him as he guides me and he leads me. I'm hoping you let the Holy Spirit just kind of fill in the blanks. Because I know this is like a blanket over a broad thing, right? Family, being called to this covenant relationship with God is a call to integrity in the relationship. You should think about that. And that's what really God's going through in 56, 57, 58 about the Sabbath, about the fasting, about what they're getting involved in and mishandling, using the Sabbath for their own pleasures instead of the pleasure of God. You know, we do that today. I mean, people, people that honor the Sabbath today and kind of pat themselves on the back real well about it, really they're using that Sabbath totally for their own desires. You know, well, I can't do nothing today because i got to chew. i got to do everything I want to do today and rest. Because we all need a day of rest. That's the concept of the Sabbath. Yes, it is a day of rest from the work. For what? For service to the Lord, yeah. For giving yourself to Him. For worshiping Him. It's supposed to be all about Him, not about me. But even in our context today of those who are supposedly keeping the Sabbath good... By not doing all the things they think that, that you're not supposed to be doing, that Sabbath still ends up being all about them. That's what was happening in Israel here. And so God was saying to them, hey, you stole my day. This is not about you and your pleasures. This is about me. Well, I can't break it all down for you. It's in there. I promise you. Go read it. And so in the context of all these things, what do we find out? Here's God calling them to a relationship with him, calling them to a covenant relationship, and they're coming up short. And God knew they would. God's called us to a relationship with him as well. Even all of humanity, as you saw, the eunuchs, the, the, the foreigners, they're all welcome to come, but we're all going to come up short. And so God has to make provision for us, and he does. We see that in chapter 59. We're going to spend a lot of time in chapter 39. I've got about another sermon here, but I'm going, to, I'm going to be flying through. We're going to read this scripture together. And we're going to see what's in the heart of God for us. He knew they could not keep the covenant relationship in their own flesh. And he knows you can't do it. Now, I, mean, I, I hate having to give disqualifiers or qualifiers, but they have to because of the way our minds work today. He knows you can't either. It does not make it okay for you. Okay? Let's never lose sight of that. He knows that you're going to fall and you're going to make mistakes. He knows you're not perfect. He knows in your own flesh you can't measure up. However, and he's made provision for that. But his provision for that was not to say, therefore, it's okay for you to sin. That's nowhere in the Bible to be found. <laughs> It's instead help to help us understand that when we fall flat on our face, we realize, oh yeah, I'm not depending on me anyway. I'm trusting God, but I'm still committed to his way. And I'm still committed to the family identity. I'm still committed to what honors him and what blesses him. So we see in chapter 59, a revelation of a blessing. So I'm going to read through this chapter together with you. We're going to make a couple stops along the way. But we're going to see the heart of God and how he deals with this issue. Behold. The Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. He knows what's up. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. Think about that for a moment. Am I oftentimes wasting breath to go and seeking God for prayer when I know I'm walking in rebellion? Yeah, oftentimes I am. When I know I'm unwilling, unwilling to deal with it. For your hands are defiled in the blood, and your fingers are uh, with nick, excuse me, with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken falsehood, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one uses righteously, excuse me, no one sues righteously, and no one pleads honestly. They trust in confession and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch Adler's eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a snake breaks forth. Their webs will not become clothing, nor will they cover themselves with the, their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and an act of violence is in their hands. And all these things God's saying, 
to just simply say this. I see what's up. I don't have any wool pulled over my eyes. I see your heart. And I know what's going on. And I know the way you respond. And so he's just helping the people to see. This is a genuine relationship I'm calling you to. Not one that we can just kind of get ourselves to work it all out. But to be fully devoted heart one to another. Their feet run evil. They hasten to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, devastation, and destruction are in their highways. This is one student. They do not know the way of peace, and there is no justice in their tracks. They made their paths crooked. Whoever treads on them does not know peace. Therefore, justice is far from us. Wow. Calling you to a relationship, a covenant relationship. And I've got some things that I'm really kind of interested in in this relationship. I've got a way of life I'd like you to embrace and walk in. It's for you good, even though you might not know it yet. It involves rest on the Sabbath and fasting. And I'm just using those as illustrations in that context. And yet, when I call you to that and I offer that to you, this is what I'm seeing. And so we look at that and we say, man, here's what I said. That's about the numbers. Not too different than who we are today. And so in the context of that, he goes on. Therefore, justice is far from us. and Righteousness does not overtake us. I mean, he's saying about our own abilities here. Your own strength, your own ability to make it happen. It's not going to let it happen, does it? Because you're going to mess up. We hope for light, but behold, darkness is there. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope along the walk like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as the twilight among those who, who are vigorous and are like dead men. Here's what's interesting. They knew they had a problem, right? I mean, that's what they're confessing in those last two verses and onward. They realized they had a problem. So they knew God was calling them to something more than just the average life. And they were struggling with that. And they're looking at themselves and they're saying, wow, here's what, here's what we look like. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there's none for salvation. But it's far from us because we know we're not, we're not living it the way he's called us to live it. Our transgressions are multiplied before you. Our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving uh, in and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself pray. You see these next three words? Four words. It was got shocked at all this. Now the Lord saw. It was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. And God's saying, well, now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. Then his own arm brought salvation to him. He made it happen, not you. All the shortcomings that you go through, all the shortcomings the Israelites were going through, God says, I'm going to fix this problem. I can take care of it. You can't. This is where we are unique in the world of relationship with God. Where all other reaching out to God, find some system by which they think they can get their life all, all figured out and get their act put together so that they can stand in the presence of God, which is ridiculous because their sinfulness is still there. This is where we stand apart from the rest and we say, we can't fix it. We're up a creek without a paddle. We've tried and we've fallen on our face over and over and over. And God says, Phew, finally we're getting somewhere. How about you let me fix it? And that's what he did in Christ Jesus. He brought by his own arm salvation to who? To himself. The salvation of his people to himself. And his righteousness held, upheld him. Whose righteousness? His own righteousness 
upheld him. He's not depending on your righteousness. You get it? This is what Jesus is all about. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet like of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to all enemies and the coastlands, he will make recompense. In other words, is there still accountability? Absolutely there is. But guess who it falls on? It falls on the shoulders of Christ and his work for us. So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. And he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion. <coughs> Merry Christmas. A redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgressions in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. Amen. I'm going to do this work. If you'll depend on me, if you'll turn to me, if you'll let me do it and not depend on yourself, this is what Christmas is all about for us this year. This is the heart of God toward us in relationship with him. They needed God's help. Chapter, verses 15 and 17. They acknowledge that. They are aware that they were up a creek without a paddle. God promised he would provide the help. And he did do that. We know that. As we're looking from this end backwards. He did it all in Christ Jesus. And for us in chapter 20. I mean verse 20 and 21 we saw that. How about for us today. Maybe here even though we know most of the people here today. Maybe there's somebody still struggling with this whole deal. And you know. You need help. You tried it on your own. Maybe you're one of those who have given yourself to full con commitment and covenant relationship, but somehow or another, you've fallen back on your own ability and try to crank it out for God somehow. And you've forgotten how to just be dependent on Him and be committed to the full covenant relationship. And your attitude is this. Lord, you say jump, I'm going to say go high. You say go, I'm going. You say stop, I'm stopping. You say do, I'm doing. You say don't, I won't. My heart is yours. And I may fall, but this is my attitude. And if I fall, I'll be the righteous man who has fallen down seven times, infinity number. But I'm going to get up every single time and say, Lord, you say jump, I say how high. You say go, I say how far, where. You say don't, I won't. You know, we go through it and we go through it because that's who we are. That's our identity. That's the relationship we're in. Don't let the enemy tell you because you should mess up that you're not his. Let, let you instead respond to the enemy and say, no, I am his. This is my identity. I messed up. I rebuke you. I submit to God. I'm walking on with him every single time. I said, well, Brother Chris, when does that no longer happen? And I just never mess up again. Not to see you face to face. <laughs> As you're living in this humanity, you're going to face challenges and difficulties. Well, that's just too hard. Well, don't depend on yourself for it. It ain't that hard. How hard is it? Everybody says it's hard to be a Christian. You've heard that's a pet peeve. You all know that. It ain't hard to be a Christian. That's an identity. You either are one or you ain't one. I know you love my, my grandmother. If you are one, be one because that's who he's called you to be. And don't depend on yourself. How hard is it for Jesus to be Jesus? Somebody tell me. And what's the identity of one who's given their hearts to Christ? Christian. And what is Christian? Christ-like. So I'm just going to let Jesus be Jesus in me. And every time there's a piece of me that shows up that doesn't look much like Jesus, I'm making some changes. I'm surrendering to Jesus, and I'm saying, okay, God, I trust you. Help me overcome this issue. I'm going to walk in a manner that honors you. Can I close with three verses? Wait a minute. I can't close with three verses, so I'm going to. 
Galatians 3.13. We're going to look at a couple verses here. It just reminds us who we are. Galatians 3.13. Here we go. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. What was the curse of the law? The curse of the law is the revelation that you can't measure up. That's essentially it. The law was given to show you your sinfulness and to show that you're utterly sinful and that you can't possibly measure up. Christ redeemed us from the expectation that the only way God will receive me is if I'm perfect in the law. And I can't possibly be. So Christ redeemed me from that, having become cursed for me. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I'm redeemed from the penalty of that. That's my new name. A better name. A better legacy than I could ever leave. I'll just get a little nostalgic here for a second. My wife and I get ready to marry off number five of six. Ooh, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> You're ready to understand. It's hard. But it's good. And, and, and the blessing in my heart is they've got a foundation in the Lord. What it means to walk with God. Listen, I don't have a legacy as a reaper that makes them anybody special. Or a rayon or whoever. It doesn't, that's not what makes somebody special. It's that they might have the name redeemed. That's the better name. That's the legacy we want to leave, right? So we've been called to read. How about Titus 2.14? In this verse, we find a little bit more information there about what it means to be redeemed. Who gave himself for us from every... Let me read this for a second. i got a different one here. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Here it is again. To redeem me and to purify for himself. So he did the purification for himself because he knew what was going to happen on our end. A people for his own possession. Oh, not for your possession. For his own possession. Zealous for good deeds. How about this? Let's go away as we do in this Christmas season as we think about who we are in Psalm 107. Unless you think this was a thought that entered God's mind in the New Testament. How about Psalms 107, verse 2, where God calls us to respond this way. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Is this not overwhelming when you consider how long ago Isaiah was written prior to Christ? Is it not overwhelming the detail that is pictured in the life of Christ that God initiated from the foundation of the world. And that when you think about it working in relationship with him, it would be the only way to work. Because we know the frailty of humanity. You know what a Christmas gift that God would give you today and give me a new name. Redeemed. Redeemed. Let's pray. Father, we